I'm Helena Gaspard from the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. Thanks for joining us at the Recovery Project today. Together with our partners, Canada 2020 and Global Progress, we launched the Recovery Project to think ahead to the opportunities and challenges beyond the emergency response to the pandemic. The Recovery Project is about bringing forward a variety of perspectives and ideas to reinvigorate our economies, enhance institutions, and to make better policy choices. Today, we're pleased to be joined by a panel of former subnational leaders that are here to share their rich perspectives and insights with us on the roles that provincial and state governments can play in recovery. Our moderator will be Scott Patterson. Scott's a senior fellow at IFSD and an expert in subnational affairs. Um, he was the executive director of the United States National Governors Association and is now the deputy executive director at the Multi-State Tax Commission. Scott, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Helena. I really, really appreciate it. And the work that the Institute has done is just, that has been really, really critical, as had, has the Canada Recovery 2020 efforts, very important. I am just so delighted to have been invited to moderate this panel because it's incredibly stellar. And of course, it's, the title is, it's talking about pivoting from crisis to recovery, which is so important. So we have some, again, some stellar individuals on this panel, very, very fortunate to hear from them. And I'll introduce the three of them and then we'll go around and they'll each have some opening remarks. First, Premier Allison Redford was Premier of Alberta, as well as Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of that province. And right now, she's doing some really exciting work with the World Bank in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And Governor Dan Malloy is the former governor of Connecticut, the former mayor of Stamford, Connecticut, and also now the Chancellor of the University of Maine. And Premier Gordon Campbell was Premier of British Columbia, as well as Canada's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. And he was also, like Governor Malloy, a mayor, Mayor of Vancouver. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to start by talking about pivoting from a crisis to an actual recovery period. You start out, and these individuals have been through crises, national disasters, and things like that. How at the subnational level, when subnational leaders are so important to this current recovery, how do you approach the switch from crisis management to actually recovering from the crisis that occurred, even when some of the crisis, in this case, health issues are continuing? And I'm going to start with Premier Redford. Well, Scott, thank you very much, and, and I really appreciate being here today to be part of this panel. I was very excited when I heard that Canada 2020 had already started to talk about this. Uh, when you're an elected official and you're in the middle of a crisis, whether it's uh, uh, a natural disaster or something like we're seeing now, or even an infrastructure issue, it's very difficult to know when to turn the corner. And of course, we've seen in national conversations in the U.S. and Canada that there are, there are people that are supportive of moving ahead and, and also uh, pulling back. It's such, a, it's such an important part of what a public leader has to do to be able to say, we're taking care of the current problems, but we're also looking ahead, not only to perhaps reopen the economy, which is sort of how this pandemic discussion has has uh, evolved into sort of health versus economy, but to that really important place in the middle, which is we were in this situation, we want to be somewhere else, but let's talk about what that is. Let's talk about what people are nervous about, what they're afraid about now, what they're afraid about in the future, and what are we also going to have to do? How are we going to have to govern ourselves differently? How are we going to have to invest differently to take advantage of these terrible circumstances and do better the next time something happens. I, often, I think, in crises, um, we talk about how this will be life-changing and the world will never be the same again. I looked back over some of the commentary when Alberta was flooded, when Colorado was flooded, and we talked about these being life-changing moments. Unfortunately, we fell back, you know, uh, subsequent governments uh, pulled back on funding on infrastructure in different jurisdictions. 
This is an opportunity where we say that things could look different. There's an opportunity to do things differently. Uh, and I hope that we will. Uh, when you're the elected face of government, being able to be consistent and solid and understand that there's something to manage now while you're managing for the future is really critical. Thank you. Thank you. And Chancellor Malloy, when you were governor of Connecticut, you certainly successfully managed through some pretty significant crises in their recovery. Well, while I was listening to Allison, I was I, I was making a note about how many of these crises I've actually had to uh, <laughs> be in public service through. And I think the, the biggest ones, if I had to guess, were the, the fiscal downturn in 2001, um, uh, 2008. Um, I came into, I was elected governor in 2010 and Connecticut was slow to, to to come out of that particular downturn. Uh, obviously, 9-11, uh, when I was mayor of Stanford, we lost a, a, a number of our citizens uh, down in Manhattan, uh, was another uh, a crisis. And uh, Sandy Hook school shooting, uh, which was a crisis uh, that uh, we had to work through in the state when I was governor as well. I, I suppose if you're gonna be in, in government, you better be ready to handle um, a, a one of these types of crises. I, I think as, as I think about the experiences I've had in the past in leadership positions and uh, uh, project forward on how we move uh, to, the, to the next level of recovery of, uh, from COVID, the COVID experience, and now sitting in, in as, as running a, a university system, um, uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's re remarkably similar and, and, and yet nuanced. Um, uh, I, you know, a chancellor doesn't get to make many calls, quite frankly. Uh, uh, you have presidents that work for you, individual universities, or work with you, I should say. Um, the governor, uh, or civil authorities, as I refer to them now, uh, uh, have a large role to play. Um, and, and what you end up doing in, in my particular and current line of work is trying to coordinate and, and make sure that everyone's talking to one another. And I, and I think that that's a very important thing. I, 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 I think most people come to a conversation assuming they know everything. Uh, I certainly have been accused of that and, and probably have acted it out. Uh, but what's really important is that everyone come to the table prepared to learn something. Uh, and if you can keep that, uh, uh, that system, that dialogue, that way of doing business um, through the crisis and then through the recovery period, uh, you're far more likely to be successful uh, in that in endeavor. I, I think when I think about our experience here in Maine or uh, in New England with respect to, to the COVID uh, 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 pandemic, um, uh, we have a lot to learn. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, we could not make a list of all the things we don't know and clearly What's very unusual about this for, for Americans is, is we don't have any control over this. Uh, the virus is gonna make decisions for us uh, and we're going to have to adapt uh, to the decisions that the virus makes for us. Uh, clearly, uh, our country was well behind uh, where it should have been uh, with respect to reacting uh, to uh, uh, signs of, of what was to come. Uh, I remember reading and. December and January, uh, uh, the problems that were being experienced uh, uh, in China. Um, and I was instantly convinced that it would show up sooner or later um, uh, in the United States, not to the degree that it ended up showing, not to, uh, to wreck the havoc that it has in, in the, the New York metropolitan area, um, or to take 90,000 of our citizens. But there was no doubt in my mind uh, that it was coming. Uh, and we began preparations for that. And now, quite frankly, we're in the preparations for the recovery. Um, and uh, a big question in the United States is what will uh, uh, education, uh, collegiate uh, university education look like? How will it be delivered? Uh, where do we meet uh, 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 our students? Where do we meet our faculty with respect to their special needs? Thank you, Governor Beloy. And Premier Campbell, you certainly had your share of times to manage a recovery in BC. Well, I think as uh, both people have mentioned, we had lots of issues to deal with. We dealt with the financial 
problems of the early 2000s, 2000, the tech meltdown, and we dealt with SARS, we dealt with avian flu, we dealt with H1N1, uh, we dealt with 2008-9, the financial collapse. All of those things are just things you can't anticipate, as been uh, mentioned. But I think this is, as many, many people have said, it's unprecedented. I agree with Allison. We always think that whatever we're going through is unprecedented. This is a significantly different framework of activities that is taking place. And it is global. And it is it creates not just a huge global challenge, I think, but it does create an opportunity for us to rethink. Now, that's a big challenge. Rethinking is not easy in politics, and I should underline this. It is way easier for us to say what to do when we're not in politics than to do it when you are in politics. So it's important to, to recognize that shortcoming of the system. But having said that, you know, I think as we look at how we turn things around, for want of a better uh, better phrase, or move in the in a new direction, uh, the direction that's both economically and socially taking advantage of what we've learned through these last number of months, I think there is there are some steps we can take. The first one is we have to recognize where we are. You don't get out of the hole if you keep on digging and digging and digging. And the tyranny of the status quo is something that actually is the most challenging thing for us to meet. It doesn't matter whether it's on the social front, the economic front, or the government front. So I think the first thing that we have to do as we look to the future is we have to rethink about what we do and how we do it. We have to rethink about how we deliver our education. We've got kids that have been home from school now for two and three, and in some cases it's going to be five months. What does, what opportunities does that open up for us? Can we change the way we provide education so children can get the kind of support that they need? Uh, what opportunities does it open up for healthcare? The wait lists that we build up in healthcare are enormous in Canada. How are we going to deal with that? Because if we try to deal with it the same old way, doing the same old things, we're not going to be successful. And we shouldn't pretend to people that, you know, we'll just carry on as if it was, I don't know, October of 2019. It isn't, and there are things that we're going to have to do and we're going to have to change. So in Canada, as you know, one of the things that we, we have is we have a, a federal deficit that is mounting. It's now been estimated it's going to be over $250 billion. And one of the things that we often forget in Canada is we also have provincial deficits. And those provincial deficits, uh, Alberta, the Premier has suggested it could be $20 billion. It's not just that their costs are way up, their revenues have collapsed, literally collapsed. Uh, we have a situation in Ontario where it has, it's the subnational government in the world that has the largest level of debt. They're estimating right now, I think, about $41 billion in debt. All of that gets added because we're all the same citizens, and we have to find new ways that we deliver the services that citizens want. So it seems to me the first two steps that we have to take to turn things around is we have to sort of take off our old glasses and put on some new ones. We can't allow ourselves to be held back by willful blindness. We can't uh, be afraid to stand up to the tyranny of the status quo and try some new, uh, new approaches. To do that, it seems to me, we have to rethink what is most important. So I'll just tell you with regard to the corona, uh, COVID-19, which we're dealing with now, the people that say we never knew that was coming are not telling you the truth or they won't pay, weren't paying attention. We dealt with, as I mentioned, we dealt with SARS. We dealt with the avian flu. Uh, we were told clearly when H1N1 came, this is part of the new world we live in. So let's not pretend we live in 1962 anymore. We don't. And we have to change the way we respond to those issues. And I think the real challenge for all of us, for those who are concerned about public policy, for those who execute public policy, is to recognize we're going to have to change the way we approach these problems. We have to be willing to embrace new ideas and try them out. And I think we have to create an encourage, encouraging opening uh, in terms of citizen discussion. Citizens, you know, people, we talk about all the frontline workers. But we've had a phenomenal response from our citizenry, from the people that live uh, and go through these changes. They've actually been a huge part of our success. Whatever success we've had, has taken place because we've shared information openly with citizens. We've tried to respond positively with them. And I believe we have to do that in terms of the economy. 
I think we have to do it in terms of education, which is a huge provincial uh, issue. We have to do it in terms of health care. And we have to do it in terms of looking at what government does. So here's a key for me right now, and this is in Canada, so I apologize for being in Canada. We better understand that economic growth is the only way we're going to be able to sustain the services we've had in the long term. We have built up massive debt and deficit, and only economic growth will get us forward. And so the question is, how do we generate that growth? And the leadership, I hope the political leadership, will ask those questions and be willing to listen to re realistic answers and the people of the country or the province or the region. I'll just close with this. We should not forget that our structures of government are pretty old. So in Canada right now, six cities have about 40% of our population. And they are actually held back by some of the constitutional arrangements that we have. And, you know, I think we have to recognize that and be, you know, the challenge, the excitement is to actually build a new framework for new action as we go ahead. Oh, excellent comments, and I know very much appreciated. Let's talk about something during recovery, especially this particular recovery that's extremely important, and that's education and getting students back in the classroom in K through 12 and getting teachers back. And certainly, we have a big issue with higher education. So I'd like each of you to address that. How should we approach getting students back? A big part of our society, of course, is students going in August or September to a particular place, either university or in K through 12 on a daily basis. And that's been quite disrupted. And I'll start with, since we're lucky enough to have a chancellor of a university system, what kind of criteria are you talking about in terms of getting the campuses back and having students and professors back in August and September? Yeah, you know, it was an amazing experience uh, going from in-classroom learning uh, in a period of 10 days to everything being offered online. Uh, I have to say that individuals responded amazingly well, and that's students as well as faculty. And there are a number of stories of students helping faculty who uh, were not uh, particularly well prepared to make that transition through that tra transition. Uh, in fact, what I would also say is we should all keep a list of things that we're learning about ourselves. Uh, the silver linings, perhaps, of what will come out of this COVID experience, um, uh, how we can be better at all of the things we do. You've asked a very specific question, and how do we reopen uh, after you've closed? Um, and and uh, to, to uh, uh, another, another wrestling point uh, on that is how do you meet people who now suddenly have to found out that they like online learning? Um, you know, uh, after the First World War, the most popular song in America was How Are You Going to Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris? So we have a much more divided uh, basis of students uh, and faculty, for that matter. Faculty in the United States uh, at most universities has spent decades opposing uh, what they had to do uh, in a 10-day period of time. Uh, and so they've learned a lot about themselves. So, uh, you know, what are we looking? We, we, we have stood up uh, can, uh, committees uh, to look at the science of it, uh, to make sure that, that whatever we do, if it's going to be uh, in classroom, that it's as safe as it can be for the instructor, for the student, for the other people in, the, in somewhere in the same building as the classes itself taking place. We're looking at uh, multiple modalities of delivery right now. Uh, uh, for as many of our courses. I think the days of a 400 or 200 person uh, lecture hall are largely over um, uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so we're probably uh, dealing with a class si uh, in-person class sizes of 50 or less, 40 or less, perhaps even 20 uh, or less. So that's a very different use of the infrastructure that we are now examining. How do we, how do we have a social distancing uh, in a classroom uh, that was designed for 30 people, but with respect to the rules that might likely uh, come out of the civil authorities could hold eight, nine, 10, or 11. So that's a, a, a very big issue. So we are rushing to uh, modernize as many of our classrooms so that we can teach courses in person, at the same time online, uh, at the same time uh, be available for call up for a student uh, who's not in the classroom and couldn't uh, uh, be online at the time that the course 
uh, was offered. If we can, if we can develop a widespread uh, delivery system that gives every student or, or many students and many faculty members uh, a three-point delivery system for every single course, we're going to, we're going to move uh, well uh, ahead of where we need to be with respect to safety. For instance, uh, let's say we had a class of 20 students. Uh, and we only want 10 to be in the room uh, at any given time. If it's a Tuesday and Thursday course, half the class is in, in, in class on one day, half the class is on the Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday. Everyone uh, who doesn't want to be in the classroom has available uh, the, the, the live experience online and then the call-up experience. So we're looking at really very different ways. Now, having said all of that, the majority of our students want to be in a classroom. The majority of our students want to go someplace to receive their education other than their kitchen. Um, and so uh, finding the right balance of safety uh, uh, and the probability uh, of a reoccurrence um, and when that might happen is very much a balancing act that we are well involved in. But I think technology is going to be a big part of the answer. And again, everybody on the side of your desk, ha have a list of the things that perhaps one day will be viewed as, as uh, those, those things that have changed us, changed us for the, the positive, and how we can magnify that effect. Other comments? Yes, Scott, I'd like, I'd like to jump in there because I think that, that what uh, Chancellor Malloy has said is, is very true. The opportunity in, in post-secondary education is very interesting. The US and the Canadian model are very different than say the UK model or even the European model in terms of, of delivering education. And some of those three point models that he's talking about are certainly part of, of what you see going on in other places. Um, but the one thing that, that we haven't yet reconciled with is what part of education is education for the purposes of learning and what part of it is based on, say, the economic model for different institutions, public and private universities. The third part, and I'd like to come back to this, because I think that universities will sort themselves out because young people understand technology better than, uh, than many other people and will respond and find a way to make this work. Um, I have great confidence in people that are 40 years younger than me um, in, many, in, many, in many parts of life. I want to come back to something that they're talking about in other parts of the world. We're not talking about it a lot here, and that is understanding what K-12 public education is all about. And, you know, there has been for 20 years or so in Canada anyway, sort of this polarized debate between, you know, should we have private schools? Should we have public schools? What is the purpose of a, of a, of a public school? And people have been afraid until very recently to say, you know, the role of a public school is not only to educate kids, it's to be a valve where we can have connection with kids that might otherwise be vulnerable. Whether it's uh, mental health issues that they may have or their parents may have, there could be dangerous situations they're living in, they could be short of food. These are all things that even though we've never publicly acknowledged the public education system did, it's been a very important tool for that. And I know that in, in Canada and in the US and in many other countries, there are debates about you know, what should the role of the state be in all of this. But I have to say one of the things that I've been encouraged by is the public discussion recently on the fact that education is so much more than we've ever said that it should be and could be so much more. You know, maybe in some ways education has defaulted into doing some of these things because there aren't other agencies that should do it. Maybe schools are the best place to do it. Maybe other places are the best place to do it. But what I think is exciting about the conversation which Premier Campbell talked about is now is the time to, to challenge those ideas and to say, how do we move beyond the status quo and how do we move beyond basically the polarization of left-right politics? which has become so much a part of everything in our political discussion. And now we have an opportunity to look differently at what is the role of the state and, you know, as Premier Campbell said, what is the role of the state in economic development, but also how do we invest in community and society in a way that really builds partnerships. We've seen citizens come to the fore and 
you know, provide meals and create all sorts of really interesting social projects that have drawn vulnerable people into more public spaces, which is good for them. So how do we build on that? And I think that's an important part of what we can think about in the education system, et cetera. I'll just jump in because why wouldn't I write? <laughs> it's, uh, let me just say that I think that the first thing we have to ask about ourselves about education is what do we expect of it? And I think there's a unique thing we could do, which we haven't done enough. And that is to ask the, the members of Generation Z, what do you think works? What works for you as an individual learner? Because I believe we have the resources, and I think the Chancellor may agree with this, we have the knowledge within the system to respond to the individual needs that students have, whether they're individual student in university, or the individual needs of the young, very young person who's getting ready for school. But we have to be willing to invest in education. I think we still have a lot of sort of yellow sticky notes that we put up on the education board and say, well, why don't we try this that we've always tried before? So I, I would like to go to Generations Ed and say to them, what worked for you? And, and I'm sure um, that the Chancellor will be able to you know, acknowledge that parents want to be involved in their kids' education. and I believe all parents want to be sure the education system or education is provided to their child is the best it can possibly be. And that means we have to think about individual learners and we have to recognize that one of the opportunities the digital world and the information world gives us is to be far more individualized in the response we have, far less programmatic and far less industrialized. I mean, we still have schools in terms of what we think of as a school, it's kind of like it was 150 years ago when we had, that was the first building that everyone built in the community. So we have to be willing, I think, to open the walls of the school up because I think it creates more learning. I agree with Allison that there's more than just learning that's going on there, but we also have to use the new research we have. We know more about cognitive development and learning today. We've learned more in the last 10 years than we knew the previous 150. And why aren't we, why can't we be smart enough to develop the tools that actually puts that to work? And I think one of the challenges we've had, I can tell you when I was a premier at any rate, we all talk about children and we invest in seniors. And that's a challenge. There's a generational balance that we have to find. And that generational balance will, I think, mean more investment in education and different kinds of investments in healthcare. And those are two huge things that drive uh, Chancellor, provincial economies in Canada, the provinces are responsible for healthcare, right? So it's a public, a single payer system, and I, I think we can develop that. But these are things that I think are just core and fundamental. And I think it's also an opportunity to, to open up the schools and take down the school walls and open up the windows to the world and the windows that all of our students have in their minds. We can ask the community in to come in and help teach, help inform. Help show them what's going on. I, this is a long time ago now. There's, you know, the world was all, I think it was just after Noah's flood. But when I was in school, I had maybe three thoughts of what I might be able to do as I went into the future. And there were all sorts of people that could have just, you know, stimulated and excited me about the opportunities of learning. And when I taught, I can tell you one of the great things about teaching is when you light that fire in a young person that they just, they can't get enough of what they're learning. We should be able to find an education system and response that does that. And that's part for me of the rethinking of education, the rethinking of what is essential in government, because we can't simply keep on doing everything we're doing now. And I would argue, we shouldn't keep on doing everything we were doing before. We have to look at the world in a different way and say, we can do better. And who, how do we bring people in to help design that? And I would put generations that at the top of my list for the design whether it's in education or healthcare or the environment, they have something to offer and they're gonna be a lost generation unless we include them and listen to them and act on their advice. You know, this now, I don't know if you saw this, but in April, and this is in, uh, in Canada, youth unemployment, at generations at unemployment is 27.2%. We've never had that before, that I, certainly not since 1976 we've had. And those people are going to say, 
not just what are you going to do for us, but it is time for you to change. So we have the sense of opportunity that you did when you were leaving university, when you were leaving high school, when you were looking at the future. Their future they're looking at right now is they're being told by people that are our age, we've got a collapsing economy, we've got a collapsing environment, and you know we've got a collapsing job market. That's not a very exciting way to move, move into the world. And I think we have an opportunity and an obligation to create that excitement in young people so they build the kind of world that they want because they're going to be living in the future a lot longer than we are. And I, I'm really, actually, I'm feeling so much more positive just hearing from you all that some real good things can come out of the recovery of this crisis. I wanted to ask, uh, we're really, it's terrific. We're getting a lot of questions from the audience, which is a good sign and indicates stellar panelists. So I wanted to ask one of the questions that came in, and that is to what extent will this recovery from COVID affect climate change? Will it be better or will it be worse since there'll be such an emphasis on increasing economic output rather quickly? Um. I, I'd love to, I, I saw that question come up and I thought of when all of this first started, I'm sure that everyone remembers seeing the stories about how, you know, if you were living in India, you could see the Himalayas again. And, you know, I, I think all of us have probably seen an awful lot more um, nature in our neighborhoods. Um, it's been a pretty solid reminder that, that we can't go forward the way that we have before. There, there again are, I think, different ways to do that. I'm from Alberta and, you know, I was premier and certainly uh, we had a, a, a province that was very reliant on oil and gas revenue. Uh, and so I don't think it will come as a surprise to anyone that, that the way that I see us going forward is that we can't discount economic activity that will allow us to grow the economy. However, I do think that there is an opportunity, and there has been for some time, which honestly, I don't think all industries that do have an environment, environmental impact have acknowledged, that there are things that industry can do better and differently and faster to acknowledge and deal with climate change. And, and I think that as we talk about doing things differently, it's very important for us to not fall back on saying, okay, well, we're not going to encourage economic growth in this area because there have been problems in the past. I think everyone internationally clearly understands that there is still a demand for some of those forms of energy that are not as sustainable as others. It's still uh, cost-effective energy, but that doesn't mean that it has to have an environmental impact. And there are ways to manage that better. And all of the time that I was in politics, I was an advocate for trying to bring together that different conversation. And I do think that there is a part now, Scott, and you're correct, that, that there will be a lot of companies and industries saying, look, leave us alone. We just need to get on with growing so that we can put money back in coffers. And, and that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, it's going to take time and it's going to take a pretty frank conversation. And I think it's a conversation that isn't just one that young people should be observing. They should be participating in it. And, and I think that when we start talking about um, doing things differently, it's not going to be for Generation Z. It's going to be with Generation Z. And, you know, I, we'll see what their patience is with us. Uh, in terms of, you know, how they decide to get involved in the political process, in civil society, um, it's shifting anyway. And so I would say that certainly the lack of activity has demonstrated to us that climate change is real. And now the question is, how do we grow the economy and make sure that it doesn't have the kind of impact that it's had previously? You know, uh, if I might, I, I think the geopolitical fallout of climate change is going to be magnified and, in fact, is being magnified by the COVID experience. Um, uh, and, and quite frankly, I think it's going to be interesting to watch as the COVID experience changes from hemisphere to hemisphere, uh, uh, side of the equator or, or uh, which side you're on. Uh, it, it's going to be even further magnified over the next six months to nine months as, as, as we look at the various experiences. You know, the Himalayas, which were mentioned, provide uh, the drinking water and the agricultural water of 20% of the world's population. 
uh, when it stops melting, because it can no longer be sustained, that means 20% of the world's population is going to be without water. Uh, if you look at the uh, change in the uh, jet stream over the last eight years and the, and the vortex experience that uh, has been had in, in uh, parts of the United States, uh, uh, again, it's a, it's a reminder of, of, of how much more desperate we might become uh, as uh, these changes play themselves out and how unprepared we are uh, for those, those uh, changes. I'd, I'd like to go back to something Gordon said uh, uh, previously, and I, I think education is going to be more precious uh, to the people of Canada and the people of the United States than it's ever been before. I think it's going to be better understood and better engaged in uh, than it has been in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, I've had the experience of going up and down the grocery uh, uh, line to, to get the, our food stuffs or paper stuffs, which became their own particular problem in the United States, uh, and, and listen and overhear conversations between parents struggling with how do they sustain the education of their child when there's no classroom to go to uh, and, and limited access to a teacher uh, uh, online. Uh, I, I, think, I think our view of the important mission uh, of, of teachers, of institutions is about to rise very dramatically as, as a result of, of, of this experience. And, and Gordon is absolutely right. How do we take this experience and apply the lessons learned? Uh, should we have longer school years now that we know that they might be uh, interrupted from time to time? Uh, should we have multiple modalities for pre-K through 12 education delivery systems set up uh, for, for the future? Should we be invested in that? Uh, is there a reminder course that should be engaged in uh, over, over these long summers that the United States enjoys with respect to school uh, uh, time out? I, I think we're going to start to examine those things in earnest, and I don't think it will be forgotten all that quickly. Uh, a, a, a very difficult and bad experience we may want to put behind us, but I think we're more likely to learn from this one than some of the others that, that I've mentioned that, that I've had to govern through. I, I, I agree with that. And, and I just I just wanted just to say, I, if I was asked what are the essentials, one of my essentials would be education, for sure. And one of the other ones would be was is the environment. And I think we have to take off our old environment hats and start recognizing that we all have an impact on the world. Start creating and start looking, stop looking for enemies and start saying, how do we solve these problems? Uh, in British Columbia, and I was there, we did a revenue neutral carbon tax. Lots of studies were done that showed it didn't have a negative impact on the environment, on the economy, but it actually had a positive impact on the, in terms of emissions. We have to, you know, one of the challenges I have with the environment is too many people are willing to say, you're not doing enough. And I think what we have to say is, we are all part of it. I don't know anyone that doesn't want to see a snow-capped Rocky Mountains, right? But we're in danger of losing them. I don't know anyone that doesn't love the rivers that run through or our countryside, right? But there is a danger what's taking place with those things in terms of climate. So I don't even think we need to have the argument about, is it a real long-term problem or not? I, I, I'd ask people, how many people out there are expecting to have an, an accident when they get in their car today? And they say, no, I'm not. Well, why are you buying insurance? Is it this week you're getting the accident? Or is it this month? Or maybe this year? Oh, no, I'm not expecting one. But we're willing to provide the insurance that's necessary so that we can get through. If there is a problem, we can get through it. I think that's the least we can do for the environment. And uh, frankly, I totally agree with Alice. I think one of the problems is when you say to people, I don't care about your job. Your job doesn't matter to me. That's a really good way to make sure they're not going to be part of your, your team. And we need everybody on the team. And we need to understand how this works. And I can just tell you, there's no panacea out there. Uh, you know, the electric car is not a panacea. Now, redesigning cities so you don't have to get in an electric car, that might be part of really making real progress. Reducing the demand that we put on the system may be part of making real pro progress. But, you know, those are the questions we have to be willing to confront. And frankly, I think those are the questions that we have to look to some of, you know, we've had a pretty good shot at trying to deal with these problems that we're talking about. I think we should ask the people that are a lot younger than us and a lot smarter in some cases than us and say, what do you think we should do? And we should, we should give them the benefit of whatever we've learned. But on, in terms of the climate, we have to deal with climate change. It has to be comprehensive. 
It has to be thoughtful. And, you know, people in Canada, very few people in Canada know the first province that actually put a tax on carbon was Alberta. It wasn't any place else. It was Alberta, right? So we have to celebrate the little successes we have so we can build big successes out of that. As a friend of mine says, step by step by step. If we know where we want to go, we can get there if we work together. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the opportunities is that, that in some ways, a lot of the discussion that we're having now has just been accelerated by this unfortunate pandemic. There's a lot of people that are willing to think about changing the framework. Uh, and now we're seeing a couple of things. One is that they're willing to move fast. Uh, lots of us are willing to move fast, quickly. We're willing to work differently. And we're prepared to identify the risks differently. And, and that's something that uh, we don't have the luxury of time for anymore. And you know, as, although there have been terrible things that have come out of this circumstance, those are some good things that people are ready to focus and try to solve some of these problems differently than they have in the past, I think. You know, I, I so Scott, think if that, I could sorry, sorry, Dan, go ahead. Say to, Gordon, to, to your advice, Gordon, I, I, I think we, we need to remind uh, younger people when we speak to them that they should do as we say, and certainly not uh, as we have done, and we should be prepared to do as they do and, and not necessarily what they say. I, I think what we're about to learn in the United States um, is that our health, our, our reliance on, on private coverage through a job on health insurance is about to be uh, newly uh, tested, uh, not by the poor in the nation, but by the middle class and upper middle class uh, who have suddenly become unemployed. Uh, and I, I suspect in the long run, what we'll, uh, what we'll uh, uh, adapt to uh, is a single payer backstop uh, uh, augmented by uh, uh, the existing system as, as we know it in the United States. I, I, but, but even to, for me to be able to say that and say it with some certainty that I think a whole new examination is about to play itself out and have different results, uh, uh, it would not uh, uh, have happened in the next 20 years, but for the experience of unemployment that we're going through as a result of the COVID experience. And then quite frankly, the reminder of how unfair this treatment has been uh, the Navajo Nation in the United States is the most diseased uh, a portion of our society. Uh, black and Hispanic people's death rates and, and uh, people living in poverty in our country are by far the, the most impacted outside of those living in, in nursing homes and congregate care. Uh, this is an amazing wake-up call uh, that, that we have to turn to the good uh, once we've finished the process of mourning the passing. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's interesting, I, you know, I, Scott, if I could jump ahead, I was just looking at some of the questions on the chat line, and it, it's interesting how when we ask questions about things like, uh, you know, what is the narrative in North America, how are we thinking about ourselves in relation to the world, you know, are we becoming more protectionist? You know, there are two ways right now to look at what's happening in North America. One of them is that. The other is that if you actually, and, and both um, the Chancellor and, and the Premier said this, what we're seeing is community and civil society working entirely differently than when we ever than we ever expected it to, not because of anything the government did, but because communities decided to go out and start taking care of each other and watching out for each other and entertaining each other and supporting each other. And so there is a narrative that, you know, maybe people are becoming slightly more insular, but there's also a very positive narrative in that people are reaching out, they're recognizing their neighbors, they're spending more time together, they're slowing down. And I think it's important to augment that as well, because that is what lets us have the kind of conversations that we're having today in a very open uh, forum where we can explore new ideas and, you know, as the Chancellor said, talk about a healthcare system in the U.S. that simply wasn't on in the cards a year ago. Pretty amazing. Let, let, me, uh, let me apologize. I realize I may be creating an international incident by failing to refer to the two of you as Premier, so I apologize <laughs> for, uh, for, for that. So. We don't really do that in Canada. We don't do that in Canada, really. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I was, I was, when I was mayor, I was your worship. When I was premier, I was premier. I was high commissioner as your excellency. And now I'm just Gordon Campbell. Yeah, yeah well, very, for most of my time in public life, I was that bum. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, I just want, I just want to say that one of the things that I think that both the chancellor and, the, and Allison have pointed out is this. 
You know, ideology kills discussion and kills progress. When you say, I'm not even willing to consider that, I don't care about that. This is, you know, forget the facts, forget what's taking place in the world, forget what we know. I don't like that idea. That hurts us. And if it hurts us in healthcare, I would, I would hesitate to say, I'll say it in Canada. It hurts us in Canada in healthcare, and it, it may even in the United States. Who knows? But it does hurt. It holds us back. Same thing with education. So part of this is, you know, we have a chance now. People are saying they want to open up. Well, let's really open up. Let's really look to the, let's look differently in a different way. Let's find, who doesn't want a job? I haven't met a political leader that doesn't want to make sure people have jobs. How do we do that? What, what, do we, what have we learned, not just from now, but from past experience about how you generate jobs? How do we create jobs in a new digital economy? How do we have people go to work that they love, as opposed to go to work that they have to go to work? Those are things that we can actually aspire to. So I think in terms of what can we do, I think one of the things that sub-national leaders can do, and I, actually, I take my hat off to Arnold Schwarzenegger for doing this when he was the governor of California, he didn't care what your party was when he was advocating for his positions on climate change. And you know, he had, he had the Western, I remember when we did the Western Climate Initiative, whoever would have imagined, I talked to him in December, I think of probably 06, maybe 06, whoever would have imagined that that Western Climate Initiative would get, include Ontario and Quebec. But it did because he took down the barriers. He wasn't building barriers up, he was taking them down. To accomplish a goal and I think that's what we have to do now we have to take down the barriers of all of the expertise that we can we have to include the public in the discussions we have to form a public agenda and I think that would be a really exciting thing for premiers to do across our country or for governors to do across the country and frankly it would be very exciting for civic leaders to do it and for the premiers and the and the federal leaders to say it's time to change how we allow cities to deliver services because it makes a difference. Vancouver is, I can tell you, I've lived in Vancouver all my life. I live in Ottawa now. They're both nice cities to live in, but they are different cities and they have different challenges and different opportunities. We should harness that. We should both liberate it and harness it as we move ahead. And then we'll get positive changes that make a real difference in people's lives. And, and that's a really good segue to talking about exactly what specifically do you have thoughts on at the subnational level, what mayors, county commissioners, premiers, governors can do specifically both within the public sector, but also within the private sector to generate the jobs of tomorrow, to work on workforce issues and get the economy going again. You know, I, I think uh, one of the issues that, that we're going to struggle with um, and, and make substantial changes and is, is a supply chain. Is something as easy uh, as that or as common sense. What we've learned in the United States is over-reliance on foreign production uh, that, that, that we're not attached to, our, our Canadian cousins, uh, is, is a very difficult proposition um, uh, going forward. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't, and I'm not talking about this in a protectionist kind of way is that how, how do you get something from here to there or there to here um, uh, is going to be a very big issue and I think and I think it's going to become part of the, the new American psyche uh, what percentage of whatever is consumed is actually and is needs to be consumed in emergencies is actually produced uh, uh, in North America uh, it's going to be a very different conversation something that you know years ago when I was was mayor would never have thought about or have worried about even having gone through some of the crises uh, that we previously went through. So I think that there, there is going to be a whole different set of issues that people um, uh, as mayors or as governors or as premiers or as federal leaders are going to have to start con to consider because uh, uh, you know the mirror has been raised up and we've looked at ourselves and we were found wanting. Well, I, I think one of the, sorry, I think one of the challenges uh, that that we all have is we have to make sure our public understand how the trading system works, how our economy works, what does the supply chain look like? I mean, I would bet, um, and that there's not very many people in the United States that know that Canada is their major supplier of energy products. Right. I think they think it's from the Middle East. It's just north of the 49th parallel. And I, I think that one of the things we have to do as we do this, and I, I think that mayors are actually well positioned 
is really engage people in what they want. So in terms of what can we do to sort of stimulate private sector jobs, I think the first thing you do is recognize what you do to drive private sector jobs out. So I can remember, I can't remember what year this was, but probably early in the 90s, maybe late 80s, uh, there was, from that time on, everyone has told us how important small business is. Yes. I'd ask you to go back and look at what governments have done to small business. Property tax is loaded up onto small business because it's easier to do that than to tax the residential. Uh, we watch as uh, in Canada, medical taxes or health taxes have gone up, CPP has gone up, minimum wages have gone up. All of those things are about small businesses. And there's a sense that, gee, small businesses are all just raking it. They're not. They maybe have a margin of maybe 3% if they're lucky. And I can remember from when I was mayor, I'm sure Dan might have this memory too, at one point, the city was going to change the parking regulation and not allow any parking on, on a major street. And the small business community came to us and said, you can't do this. This will, this will change my business. And of course, all the smart people, I didn't actually, I didn't vote for this as you recall from the end of the story, but all the smart people said, oh, well, we're going to change it anyway. Within a year, there were vacant shops all along that, that road. And so we have to remember, if we really want jobs, what do you do to encourage jobs? Do you make it more costly for small businesses to hire people? Do you try and say, well, the government will pay for the job for you? Because that government money comes from small businesses and you and I and people across the country. What do we really do? Because so far, I would say that all the talk about encouraging small businesses because they're major job creators is really belied by the actions that have been taken. And if you ask small business you know, owners and young entrepreneurs and people who are trying to make it work, they would tell you that. They're overburdened by regulation, by taxation, and somehow or other, in spite of all the words, they don't feel like anyone really cares about it. And they are the ones that drive our growth. So we have to, again, put on a new set of glasses about that and recognize if we really care about that, let's try and do something about that. And that means change. And that means, you know, I understand the change. And as I said before, it's way more difficult to do the change than talk about it. But if we set that as a goal, it's incredible what we'll accomplish and it won't be nearly as difficult as we think. Well, and it's, it's interesting Gordon says that because you know we're, we're kind of unique in Canada in the sense that we're a lot of land and we're not a very big population. And so there's a lot of talk about buying local and the 100 mile diet that a lot of people in Canada would aspire to live by but up until now, it's been a bit of a challenge, partly because the supply chain has been pretty efficient. You know, we can go to very large stores and get product at a much lower price. And it's not the same now as it was in terms of how people, um, since the pandemic is, has started, in terms of how people shop, where they shop, why they shop. And you hear a lot more people now talking about buying locally and not wanting to go to large stores because they might be exposed and that sort of thing. And so I think that we start to see a shift. Um, you know, today the Prime Minister and the President announced that the Canada-US border will be closed for another 30 days. I think people sort of understand that, but are also slightly disappointed because they know that that trade relationship is so important. Now we know goods are moving back and forth, but it's also people. And so I have a sense that maybe coming out of this, we see, you know, North America continue to thrive as a very strong economy, uh, you know, particularly consider, as Gordon said, understanding, you know, where's energy coming from, where's beef coming from, that sort of thing. And actually, in some ways, maybe, although we've just gone through an after discussion, I'm not sure if it would have been the same discussion if we were going through it right now or a year from now. So I think that about what does a North American economy look like? What does the supply chain look like? How are we encouraging job development at a local level? You know, I, I, think, that, uh, I think that most people in the talk to now understand the importance of small business because they all know somebody has been, has been affected by the fact that a small business is closed down. Either a friend doesn't have a job anymore or a child that can't save for university it's all starting to have a trickle-down effect, and a lot of it is not based on large corporates. It's based on small community businesses that are really being innovative in terms of working online and finding ways to thrive. And it's great to see the community respond to that. But I, I think that 
cities have a responsibility now to try to even look not just at things like taxation and regulation, but how are our cities designed? So going back to these questions that are part of what the real conversation should be. You know, do we have a public transit system? Do we have residences being built next to community uh, businesses? You know, how close are the schools that our kids are going to? Are they going to have to get on, uh, you know, do they have to be driven to school? I mean, the idea of sort of reorganizing the way that our cities uh, exist will change the economy of cities. And, you know, as, as, as Gordon said, we have six cities in Canada that have such a high percentage of our population, but that in itself will start to drive change. And, and let me ask along those lines, because unfortunately we have to finish up, but this has been really fantastic. But why don't each of you address more or less the, both the economic and the financial management aspects. You've had great experience in your careers and we see revenue crashing in cities, counties, states, provinces. What do you think is the best way both economically and financially as we go into this recovery to deal with that? In the, uh, in the United States, uh, the vast majority of our states cannot operate in deficit uh, by constitution, by their, by their state constitution. Um, and so we're about to be challenged uh, very seriously on that particular point. And it is already becoming a dividing line between Democrats and Republicans as to whether uh, support should be lent to municipal governments or state governments. Uh, there's, there are people who would like to pit the interests of poorer states against richer states, taking states versus uh, ascending states. Uh, and I think that that's um, a terrible uh, argument uh, to be engaged in, quite frankly. The earliest efforts, uh, the second round of the CARES Act actually was uh, looking, uh, or the third round, I should say, what was looking to the support of uh, of smaller companies, and so with a, a, a payment uh, protection program uh, uh, was 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 in fact geared uh, towards small business. Although they didn't write the rules well enough to prevent large scale business from from not taking up the lion's share of the of the uh, K second CARES Act. So I, I I fear that that we are about to create some of the uh, 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 same problems that 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 come with our system of over reliance on property taxes non-deficit spending on, on a state-by-state -state basis, not literally not allowed constitutionally, um, uh, and where that may leave uh, our, our poorest communities within those states. It's, it's a very serious problem, and, and, and one that may not be revolved, uh, resolved before uh, uh, around a, a new set of elections in, in November, uh, by which time problems will have been made worse uh, if we're not thinking about the small business, if we're not thinking about the mom and pops, if we're not thinking about mom and pop uh, uh, with respect to their survival uh, and the provision of education for their children, health care for their children and themselves, uh, and the ability to pay or give back to society on a broader basis, whether that's by tax revenue or simply participating in the democracy. I'll be quick and say just a few a few things. Um, number one, I think we have to include a whole new segment of the population discussion about what we have to do. Number two, in Canada, we have to recognize that there are things that we can do as one country. For example, we should eliminate interprovincial trade barriers and the burdens that that places on people. Number three, we should be smart enough to figure out how to have one process for one project as opposed to literally dozens of them, and we should get on with it. And I think we should learn to work together. I think we should learn to be nonpartisan and get on with opening up the system to the opportunities that exist, to the ideas that are out there. We just, it's a challenge and know this, as we try to meet the challenge, there'll be a whole bunch of people that say it can't be done. This can't be done and that can't be done. That is the message of the status quo. I can, my message is this, it can be done with good faith, with hard work, new ideas we can make the changes that we need to make and we can reflect that in the lives of canadians so instead of having our quality of life deteriorate over the next few years we actually have our quality of life improve that should be our goal and our objective 
if, if there's just a couple of minutes, I'd say, you know, I, I, um, Alberta has always been a fiercely conservative province. And I think I, I know I was the last premier to actually balance the budget in Alberta. And uh, that's a pretty incredible thing now because we have governments across the country that were elected a couple of years ago on fairly fiscal, uh, conser fiscally conservative agendas. But we've seen the world change so much that that's just not possible this year. And so we're starting to see governments think differently, as, as Gordon and the Chancellor said, about how we deliver services. But it's got to be a global conversation. It can't be a regional conversation. It can't be a conversation where we have, you know, you know, uh, municipal leaders in parts of the country saying, well, you know, we need support because we're the most important part of the economy. Some premiers in other parts of the country saying, no, no, we need support because we're the strongest part of the economy. The fact is they both need to contribute. They will contribute in different ways, but there are different ways to have this conversation that are outside of our conventional federal provincial um, bickering, uh, where, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about how we pay for health care and not what the health care should be that's provided. You know, there's still a lot of issues around education and health care and energy where people want to take political credit. We're beyond political credit anymore. We've got to get the economy moving. We've got to rebuild a community and a country. And the only way to do that is going to be to bring people together that even have different political points of view. Um, the idea that, that we will be able to recover well from this uh, without um, understanding that, you know, a, a, you know a, a, high, a high tide floats all boats has to be the way to go forward because we've understood that we can all be vulnerable in different ways than we thought we could. Um, you know, there's lots of people that are middle class people in Canada and the U.S. who thought that a lot of the issues that affected other people wouldn't affect them. And now everyone is feeling vulnerable. And that's why there's an opportunity to do something differently. But it's got to be a different conversation. It's got to be with different people. And I would suggest it's got to be with different institutions. I don't think that what we've had up until now in either country has let us have, as Gordon said, that open nonpartisan conversation that actually lets us explore new ideas in a way that can grow both the continent and each of our countries. Well, thank you can so I just much. Say, can I just say one oh, more thing, Scott? Certainly. I, I, need, I need the chancellor to help us all because I think it's time for us to ask people who know what they're doing, what to do. We should listen to them. We yeah. should do it. And then we should celebrate one another's successes. As, including your Scott. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, thank you so much. This has been an outstanding panel. It's been inspiring, very thought provoking. I hope we can do it again because we weren't able to get to all the questions that people had, but we certainly covered an enormous range of the important topics about pivoting to recovery for the subnationals in the United States and Canada. Thank you, Premier Campbell. Thank you, Premier Redford. Thank you, Chancellor Malloy, for taking the time out of very busy schedules to do this. And I thank the Recovery Project and the Institute for Fiscal Studies and Democracy for helping to put this together. Have a great day. You too.